I primarily live with California. Yeah. Yeah euphemistically, glamorously called Hollywood. <laughs> uh, indeed, there were uh, the New York actors, the shows that came out of New York in the golden days of radio were primarily of a documentary sense and very often a more literate sense, very often a more substantial sense. Chicago was primarily a soap opera production center because the slaughterhouses in those days were in Chicago where the soap was being manufactured of animal fats. That's and interesting. That's exactly the reason for it. And the sponsors and the sponsors' wives who decided upon the artistic merits of any artist were in close proximity to the production. And Hollywood then, you see, uh, when I began in 35, just at that point, San Francisco was the big town on the coast. And uh, up to that point, uh, motion picture artists, motion picture performers were forbidden to appear on radio for fear they would lose their, their glamour. And since tickets cost 35 cents a piece to go to the motion pictures, there was a, a real problem until someone's nephew, I suppose, in one studio decided, let our actor, our movie star, step into your living room. And the phrase was born, and suddenly there became a vogue for motion picture actors. Now, the movie star was named and starred. He was the great glamorous attraction. And that's how Hollywood expanded into the glamour show. But those surrounding him were the workaday able actors who played part after part after part. The man you just heard was radio legend Hans Conried, known as one of the most versatile actors of the 20th century. He could adroitly handle comedy, variety, or serious drama while speaking any dialect convincingly. It was a marvelous time. I learned that happily I was able to sustain myself as an actor. I don't know what I should have done for a living. I would have had to learn something else. What about from the listener's standpoint? Do you think that I think uh, today's no young people I... have lost something? Well, I don't. I, I, I do. That's, you know, with changing times, of course. The young people, I have four kids myself, and I know they have been educated or they have been entertained by the television screen. They have not read half the books at 20 that I read at 7 or 8, you know. They have not the literary background. They are in high school and college, and they are obliged to, but to read for pleasure, they don't. And the radio always seemed to me an extension of reading. Indeed, those of us who became radio actors must have enjoyed reading, or we would never have had the facility. When I tell you that at 16 or 17, or when I was 18 and became a professional actor doing then what I'm doing now, some 35 years later, I was a pretty slick reader, and uh, indeed it was such a facility that was sometimes superficial because you very often gave your very best performance the first reading, mm. and you never felt that it was necessary to improve it. So there was that unfortunate aspect of it. But by and large, uh, we were a pretty slick bunch. There were many of us engaged in it. It was. It is hard to explain to persons who have never uh, utilized it as an evening's entertainment as we in our time did. But I suppose it was as avidly followed, and it caused as much social conversation, and certainly did, I suspect, rather less harm than the popular one that might as well be nameless now, in which I also make a living. It was a, a very rich theatrical form that has not been matched, I think, in many aspects by anything that has come later. On April 9, 1944, at 3 p.m. Eastern Time over WJZ, and at 12 p.m. Pacific Time over KECA, Connery was busy playing Uncle Baxter on the life of Riley. Meat is the yardstick of protein foods because meat measures up to every protein need. The American Meat Institute presents The Life of Riley, a half hour with radio's friendliest family, and starring William Bendix as Riley. You've heard it said that meat has the right kind of proteins. Now, what does this mean? Well, simply this. Meat contains all ten of the essential protein substances which the body must have for growth and tissue repair and all the other purposes for which the body needs protein. Meat is called the yardstick of protein foods because meat measures up to every protein need. 
And now, the life of Riley. Well, as we look in on the doings in the household of war worker Riley, it is early morning. And if we may be permitted to turn the calendar back, it is two days before Easter Sunday. Riley and Peg, his ever-loving, ever-patient spouse, are having breakfast in the kitchen. Wow! Six after seven now. If I don't hurry, I'll miss the 10.30 bus. You mean 7.30 bus. About 7.30 to us, but the driver just came to California last week from Brooklyn, and he insists on using Eastern time. (laughs) Hey, Pop, I've been looking over these plans you made for my rabbit hutch. Neat, huh? Yeah, but, Pop, this is an awful small hutch. Well, it's for only one rabbit. This is strictly a bachelor apartment. (laughs) Oh, Pop, can I have two rabbits? Just two? Junior, there is no such thing as just two rabbits. (laughs) I'm going in the yard and build part of it before school. I want to have it ready by Sunday. Riley, we'll have an early dinner this evening. Don't forget, we have to do a little Easter shopping. You know something, Peg? I don't think this Easter we ought to spend money on clothes we don't need. If people go around throwing their dough away on stuff they don't need, then the first thing you know, everybody in this country will be inflated. No, I guess you're right, dear. (laughs) But don't forget, Dumplin', you're getting a new hat. Oh, no, Riley, I can make the old one do. Ah, no, you can't. Them cherries on it are getting pretty worn out. (laughs) The pits are beginning to show. Well, don't worry. I'm taking the cherries off and putting on some flowers. Ah, you use flowers with short stems. Last night in the movie, I sat behind a lady with a hat that looked like a victory garden. The only thing missing was a gopher. <laughs> well, good morning, my dear Riley. Good morning, my dear Margaret. Uncle Baxter up at 7 o'clock. Pinch me, Peg. I must be asleep. No, oh, you're awake, Riley. It is Uncle Baxter. Then pinch him. He must be asleep. <laughs> No, I assure you, my dear nephew, I'm fully awake. I've got a busy day ahead of me. Since Easter Sunday is almost upon us, I must procure my regalia. Top hat, cutaway, striped trousers, ascots. Riley, hurry or you'll be late. Oh, I've got plenty of time. Uh, Naturally, these clothes cost a bit of money. Uh, Riley... You're right, Mom, I'm late. I've got to be going. (laughs) No, wait, Riley. If I can make the sacrifice of getting up at this ungodly hour, the least you can do is to listen to me. I have a plan. Okay, I'm listening with an open mind and a closed pocket. What's it all about, Uncle Baxter? Well, the Inglewood Tribune is having a roving photographer on the boulevard on Sunday. He will snap the best-dressed man in the Easter parade who will receive a prize of $200. I will be that man. Fat chance. With a million other guys walking down the boulevard at the same time. Oh, it's inevitable that I win, because with my new outfit, I will naturally cut the most striking figure. Besides, I shall bring pressure to bear on this photographer. I'll cut him in for 10% of my winnings. Well, it would be nice if you could win $200. Oh, that's only the beginning. Having been selected best-dressed man, I will be on the threshold of a lucrative career, posing for advertising. In every magazine, you'll see my photograph. Yeah. And underneath it'll say, This old man didn't eat vitamins as a boy. (laughs) Riley, by investing a paltry sum, you'll be able to see me staring up at you from the pages of every magazine. You'll see Turnbull in morning clothes, Turnbull in afternoon clothes, Turnbull in evening clothes. Uncle Baxter, I work too hard for my dough. And I ain't spending any of it to make you a pin-up boy. Very well. If you want to wreck my entire career, so be it. Oh, come on, Uncle Baxter. Eat some breakfast. No, no, no food, please. I shall go to my room. But before I go, I want to say one thing. I am hurt. Oh. Oh, Riley, he must be hurt. He refused breakfast, and he loves breakfast. Ah, don't worry, Dumplin'. Before I'm gone five minutes, he'll surrender, and the white flag he'll wave will be a napkin. Created by Irving Brecher, the best-known incarnation of the life of Riley, came to the air Sunday, January 16, 1944, at 3 p.m. Eastern Time over the Blue Network. It starred William Bendix as Chester A. Riley and was sponsored by the American Meat Institute. 
Riley was easily exasperated, but difficult to defeat. The difficulty increased by degrees with the flimsiness of his cause. Bendix came out of the New Jersey Federal Theater Project, a latecomer to the profession, beginning at 30 when the grocery store he was running went out of business. His film career began in 1942. He was often the hooligan with a heart of gold. Riley was his most famous character. It co-starred the previously heard Hans Conried as Uncle Baxter, with John Brown as both Riley's friend Gillis and The Undertaker, Digger O'Dell. Paula Winslow was Riley's long-suffering wife, Peg. Let's talk about the life of Riley, since you were on that show virtually from the beginning, mm -hmm. weren't you? I think it was around eight years that we yeah, did the that. The whole thing. It was, really was one of the best comedy shows on radio. and it, uh, Week after week, provided great uh, entertainment for those who tuned in. And uh, William Bendix was basically uh, Riley right off the bat. Now, what kind of a guy was he to work with? Well, the reason that the show was so good is that he was also stage trained. So he mm -hmm. knew how to get a lot of fun out of the voice, mm -hmm. as well as from his face. He looked like Riley, because they later did it in television. Mm -hmm. But none of us were given the television show. They changed the whole cast. But he was funny, mm -hmm. vocally, very funny. I just loved him. He and I just got along beautifully. His wife was such a nice woman. He was very, very friendly with all of us, mm -hmm. entertained us at his home oh, that's so nice. many times. Mm -hmm. Very good, very professional. Now, and, you played uh, Peg, his, his wife, yeah. on the show. How did that come about? How did you get that job? I auditioned mm -hmm. for it. Had Irving it. Brecker was the one who the um, did the, created the show mm -hmm. and then owned it. Mm -hmm. I auditioned for it. Did they have like an open yes. hall for oh, that? Oh yes, and they, there were many you know, others, a number uh, of people. Yes, they just uh, they just still uh, liked the way uh, I was able to learn to read with Bill. You know, mm -hmm. we sort of did well together. Just one of those things. <laughs> you know. There was a great in, a great interpretation of that role that you did because at once you had to be Riley's loving wife. Mm -hmm. uh, you were also tolerant of the shenanigans that he would get involved in. You were intolerant of many of the things that he did. <laughs> well, he could be exasperated. Yeah. <laughs> in so many cases, they would do a flashback to when uh, Peg and Chester first met or <laughs> went on a date or had the baby and uh, Junior or uh, Babs. Bad. And it was interesting how the two of you would, I guess you would just lighten your voices to shave off the years, the years yeah. and go through it. Was, it was marvelous. Yeah. You did a wonderful job yeah. with, uh, with all of that. You had fun doing that show, didn't oh, you? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Mom, is dinner ready yet? Yes, Junior, but your father's not home yet. Mother, to tell the truth, I feel kind of sorry about Uncle Baxter. Well, Babs, I'm ashamed of him. He's acting like a spoiled child. Oh, your father's coming now. Now, don't say anything or he'll get excited and then the first... Hiya, Dumplin'. Hiya, kids. Oh, hi, Hello, Pop. Daddy. Hey, uh, Peg, where is he? Uh, Inglewood's fashion plate. Oh, Uncle Baxter's sulking in his room, Pop. He is, huh? He hasn't come out since seven this morning. He didn't even come out to listen to the racing results on the radio. He didn't. He must be dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got a little surprise for him that'll bring him back to life. Riley... Don't tell me you got him a new Easter outfit. Uh, oh, that was sweet of you. Well, I got to thinking what a lucky guy I am. I got a good job. I got a pretty nice wife. Oh. Couple of fair kids. Dad. Just fair. Swell house. Poor old Uncle Baxter with nothing to think about except getting dressed up for Easter. Oh, it was a very generous thought, dear. And then, uh, you know, if he should win that $200 prize, and if he used it to buy a train ticket back east, we'd be rid of him. Oh. I figure it don't pay to be too selfish. Uncle Baxter! Uncle Baxter, come on out. Dad has some news for you. Yes, if Mr. Hattie Carnegie will poke his head out, he will learn something. Come on out, Uncle Baxter. Dinner's waiting. Yeah. And if he don't shovel in some grub soon, that cutaway coat I got him won't fit. Did someone call? I thought I heard voices babbling of cutaway coats. <laughs> oh, but you're empty-handed, Riley. Is this a ruse? Oh, no. On the level, Uncle Baxter, you're getting a complete new outfit to wear Easter. 
It's on its way now. Riley, Riley, Thank bless you. you. Bless you, my dear nephew. Oh. Bless you. <laughs> all right, all right. Stop hugging me. <laughs> Riley, my boy, as soon as I win the $200, I will pay you every cent my wardrobe cost you. Okay, Uncle Baxter. And you can make it in very easy payments because it didn't cost me nothing. What? Riley, how in the world... I you... got it free off of Barney Tate, the classy clothier. He rents out high-class clothes. But I told him the way Uncle Baxter wears clothes, he's a cinch to win the prize. And that's good advertising for Barney's business. Rent a suit, eh? Well, it's better than nothing. Riley, I'll not let you nor good old Barney down. Oh, I'll get it. Hey, Pop, here's a man with a suit. In here, Barney, right this way. Well, I'll go see about the food. Come on, Barbara. Uncle Baxter wants to try on his clothes. Call us when you're dressed. Okay. All right, gents. Here's Barney with the body trimmings. Now, who do I embellish? <laughs> Barney, I want you to meet Mr. Turnbull. Charmed, Barney. Charmed. Mm, a little taller than a dummy I got in the store. <laughs> huh? I said you're a little tall in the height. Yeah. And he's also a little heavy in the weight. But he sure can wear clothes, Barney. He'll win in a walk. Oh, yes, of course I shall. Now, may I try on my togs? <laughs> hey, wait a minute. My togs. This is strictly a loan out. Yeah, here's a striped pants. Oh. <clears throat> oh, splendid, splendid. These trousers fit like a glove. Yes, sir. <laughs> now, slip off your shirt. That's it. And uh, put Richard on. Richard? This dicky. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't think of wearing a dicky. Put on the dicky, Uncle Baxter. The vest will cover the rest of the shirt that ain't there. Here, let me help you. There. <sighs> But, Riley, the end of it keeps popping up into my face. Fine, but I thought you knew how to dress classy. What do you think that string is tied to the dicky for? Well, sure, Uncle Baxter. Just slip the string down your pants leg and tie it around your ankle. <laughs> Ain't you never read Esquire? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, put on this ascot tie. It's uh, pre-tied uh, in advance. Look at it. A perfect knot. The confounded tie won't stay in place. Oh, Lummox, use the piece of string on it. Mm. Yeah, Uncle Bax, all you gotta do is tie it to the dicky. <laughs> if I have no shirt, just this dicky, what about cuffs? Here they are. Catch them. Now, <laughs> be careful of them ruby cufflinks. They set me back six bits. <laughs> How on earth will I keep these cuffs on? Ain't you never dressed formal? There's a string attached to each cuff. <laughs> Just uh, tie it to the suspenders. Certainly, you just tie it to the sus. Hey, Barney. Yeah. There's no suspenders. W what do you think those strings are dangling from the pants? <laughs> That's it. Oh, gee, Uncle Baxter. With all them strings on you, you look like a bass fiddle. <laughs> yep, yep. And here's your coat. Come on, try it on. Thank you. There. Yeah, Riley, you was right. This guy's crawling with class. Didn't I tell you? Baxter, if I didn't know it was you, I'd think you was an undertaker. <laughs> you look great. Thank you, Riley. Thank well, you. Well, here's the finishing touches. Gloves, cane, top hat. There you are, Baxter. You're all dressed from tip to toe. And well, I dare say I cut a dashing figure. Yep. Wait a minute. Well, there's one more thing. Yeah, what's that? The sign. <laughs> What sign? This oil cloth sign which goes on your back. Wait, I'll unroll it. See? Classy, huh? Read it. Barney style, sure are nifty. Look like this for $13.50. <laughs> hey, concise, ain't it? Yeah. Uh, turn around while I pin it on your back. This is preposterous. Riley, I never thought you'd sink so low as to rent out your poor old uncle's back as a billboard. Now, now, wait a minute, Baxter. I didn't know about the sign. Barney, you never said nothing about no sign. You said if I loaned this suit, I'd get advertising, didn't you? To me, that sign is advertising. And no leaning against walls, Turnbull. Keep walking and not round-shouldered, neither. What I want is visibility. Baxter Turnbull, a sandwich man for a second-hand store. Never! 
just for that crack, I'm blackballing you permanent in the outdoor advertising profession. Barney, can't we talk this over? Now? Come on, give me back the garment. As fast as I can. Uh, here, sir. And here. And here. Oh, 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 gee, I'm sorry, Uncle Baxter. Riley, I... how could you humiliate me this way? Well, I didn't know he wanted to hang a sign on your spine. <laughs> Retain those cuffs. Here, Mr. West. Take your shabby rags and go. Yeah, beat it, Barney. Nobody's going to open up a second front on my uncle's back. <laughs> oh, no. Well, I'm going, sports. I'm going, and here and after, don't contact me on my garments. I'm much too busy to have a boom. What happened, buddy? I tripped on one of the strings. <laughs> well, Riley, this was a grim jest, I must say. I told you I didn't know about the sign. Why don't you get your own Easter clothes? Get a job, earn some dough, rent an outfit. Ridiculous. I can't find employment in one day. Haven't I been looking for 32 years? I could... <laughs> I could get you a job in 10 minutes, I bet you. I accept the wager. Find me a job and I will take it. Okay, wise guy. But if you fail, Riley, it must be understood that you will buy me an Easter outfit. It's a bet. In 10 minutes, I'll either make you a workhorse or I'll make you a clothes horse. <laughs> While Riley sets out to achieve the impossible, namely getting a job for Uncle Baxter, this is Ken Niles. I wonder how many millions of American families are having their traditional Easter dinner of baked ham today. You know, it's a grand and glorious feeling to be able to serve this fine Easter meat and know that it only costs three ration points per pound. Sharon Douglas was Babs, and Conrad Binion played Junior. I didn't really realize the tremendous responsibility that went along with it. I just did the best I could. Mm -hmm. I was hired for other roles in different other shows because the word would go around, hey, there's some, I guess there's some new blood and uh, you might mm -hmm. want to use this fella. And, and I was hired for other roles too. In the beginning, eight, nine, ten years old, 13, 14, 15. It was very interesting, and it was very educational. I mean, I got to work with adults. I was in an adult environment, and what was real great, I got to hear all the funny jokes that was, was always being told during the rehearsals. And I really became quite a storyteller and joke teller in my own right. I'd tell the other kids at school all these all these jokes, and because they were kind of semi-level of, of an adult level, you know, they're a little risque in some areas, I was quite the guy to be... Uh, uh, you know, it did, did me great stead at school. I was very, very much in demand as the storyteller at school because I knew all mm -hmm. these jokes. How long did this period of your life last then where you were doing roles on the radio? From about mm -hmm. uh, eight till the time when I went into the service when I was 21 uh -huh. years old. Meeting the need of both our fighting forces and our civilians in the home. And now back to the life of Riley. It's a few minutes later, and Riley is on the phone trying to get Uncle Baxter that job, or else Riley loses his bet. Well, Riley, you've made seven calls and no job for me yet. <laughs> well, I almost got you a job at the delegatessen. Only Mr. Greensprickle said he wouldn't hire any clerk. He'd have to weigh every time he wanted to take inventory. <laughs> Time is fleeting, Riley. Why not admit you've lost? You owe me my Easter tongue. I ain't licked yet. There must be somebody in town who would hire you. Somebody who don't know you. Uh, pardon my coming right in, Mr. Riley, but I got too much work and no time to do it in. Well, Sam Graham, the cleaning man. Yeah. Is that my wife's dress she had cleaned? Yeah, take a look at me. Established 22 years, same location, and I got to do all of my own delivering. I can't get no help. You hear that, Baxter? Surely, Riley, you don't think that Listen, I... Listen, Sam, I... Yeah. you've got a lot of stuff to deliver for Easter, and you need help, right? Yeah. you got to have help. Yeah. In fact, you're desperate for some help. Yeah. How about hiring Uncle Baxter? No, sure not. Now, wait a minute, Sam. <laughs> Riley, this is nonsense. I, a delivery boy? You said if I got you a job, you had to take it. Now, look, Sam, don't be hasty. You need help bad. Well, I know, but Uncle I... Uncle Baxter is a working fool. Look at him. Look at his arms. Like buggy whips, ain't they? I mean, they're long, see? <laughs> I was on. 
arms that long, he could deliver ten coat hangers full all at once. Yeah, but how about his legs? Can they take it? Legs? Why, just come over here and feel the muscles in his legs. Uh, uh, wait a minute now. There's got to be muscles here someplace. <laughs> Riley, don't pull up my trouser leg. I refuse to be haggled over. Well, Mr. Riley, I'll tell you, he ain't no bargain, but like you say, I'm up against it, so... Okay, so I'll take him on for one day till Easter. That's the stuff, Sam. This is high bindery. Uncle Baxter, leave me congratulate you. For one day at least, you have retired from unemployment. <laughs> Good morning, Riley, and happy Easter. Oh, happy Easter, Dumplin'. Did you have a hard night at the plant, dear? Yeah. yeah, but by giving up my sleep last night, I get all today off to do whatever I want to do. You deserve a day off. What are you going to do? Sleep. <laughs> well, take a bath first and eat some breakfast. No. Nah. No, I'll just take a nap on the couch here to get up enough strength to go to bed. <laughs> You don't want to lie down in those dirty old work clothes? Uh, okay, then just stand me up in a corner someplace. <laughs> oh, boy, I'm so tired, nothing could keep me awake. Did you hear about Uncle Baxter? Oh, well, what's he done now? Well, it looks as if he made good delivering for Sam. Did he make good enough to rent a suit for the Easter parade? He must have. He's in his room getting all togged out in something. He's sure he's going to win that prize. Well, well, children, how do you like my Easter ensemble? Huh? Oh, oh, it's lovely, Uncle Baxter. That cutaway coat and those striped trousers. Uh-huh. Riley, how do you like this yellow vest? Oh, fine. It's the first time I ever seen a double-breasted sunset. <laughs> well, I gotta catch a little shut eye on the couch. Well, I'm off. To give the populace a sartorial thrill. Go out and win, Uncle Baxter. Aviento, Riley. Aviento, babe. Good luck, Uncle Baxter. Uh, good luck. Oh, goodness. He's asleep already. <laughs> Hey, Mr. Riley. Mr. Riley, wake up, Mr. Riley. It's Sam Graham, the cleaning van. Uh, I'm pleased to meet you. Come back next week. <laughs> Mr. Riley, I gotta see you. Mr. Riley. Riley? Oh, I think he's here someplace. Huh? Uh, the, the Riley? Uh, that's me. Uh, Mr. Riley, uh. this morning I wake up, my doorbell starts ringing. A client. He wants his cutaway coat. Then my doorbell starts ringing again. Another client. He wants his striped pants. Somewhere lately I seen striped pants in a cutaway. Yeah, then my doorbell rings again. Another client. Where is his yellow vest? A yellow vest? A yellow vest? Yeah. It's all coming back to me now. You mean Baxter delivered them clothes to himself? <laughs> Mr. Riley, if them clothes are lost... Now, wait a minute, Sam. They ain't lost because I know just where they are. Where? On Uncle Baxter. <laughs> Riley, I'm holding you responsible. You made me hire him. Sam, you got a car out there? Yeah, my delivery truck. Then deliver me down to the boulevard. I'll get them clothes back for you, Sam. And when I get through, Uncle Baxter will finish the Easter parade in his union suit. Oh, stunning, Baxter. Simply stunning. <laughs> In your case, the man makes the clothes. <laughs> no, yes, my dear Matilda. When one has a large wardrobe like mine, I feel... Uh, uh, by the way, you haven't seen one of those camera johnnies about, have you? I so despise publicity. <laughs> oh, no, I haven't. Oh, Baxter, dear, all your busy Tuesday. I'm giving a tea to Lady Patricia Flick. Uh, oh, tea? How jolly. I shall be delighted to nibble at a scone with you. <laughs> oh, dear me. There are some perfectly awful-looking men coming behind us in a delivery van. Ignore them, shall we? I think they're following us. The idea in a dry cleaner's van. What? A dry cleaner? 
Let's walk a little faster, shall we? Hey, wait a minute. Baxter, is that person in those greasy overalls addressing us? Uh, Let's hurry on. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, Mr. Yellowfest. I would like to have a few words with you alone. Uh, Run along, my poor fellow. I'll see you later. You'll see me now. If you don't, my uncle's gonna be in very big trouble. Get the coat! Get the coat! (laughs) Well, is 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 that strange man in the truck your uncle? Oh no, madame. He's after my uncle on account of my uncle borrows clothes that people don't want to lend him. I'm sure if you give your uncle a chance, he'll return the clothes shortly. Come along, Matilda. Uh, Get the bed! Get the bed! (laughs) Okay, Uncle Baxter, you can't take a hint, so take off them clothes. Uncle Baxter? Mercy, are you the one they mean? Certainly not. Don't forget the pants! Don't forget the pants! Take them off, Baxter. Riley, please, I beseech you, in the street. Give me a little time. Riley, oh, you do know him. Well, never mind Tuesday's tea, Mr. Turnbull. You'd feel out of place. The guests are wearing their own clothes. Hey, Riley, Uh, get him into the truck. uh, uh, Don't grab the lapels. (laughs) Riley, how could you disgrace me like this? Come on, Baxter, or do I have to drag you? Get his feet, sir. Oh, wait, wait, stop. Here comes the cameraman. I can still win the prize. Riley, take your hands off me. Oh, okay, but just for the picture. Oh, boy, this is the picture of the day. Hold it, gents. I'm ready. Smile, Baxter. Uh, he got it. I sure did, mister. And if you want to see it, buy the next edition of the Inglewood Tribune. <laughs> corner, Pop. A truck drives by here every night and drops off bundles of papers. Excellent. I'll get the first copy. No, I'll get the first copy. It's my nickel. But it's my picture. I won the contest. Here comes the trick now. Yes, and I could certainly use that $200 prize. Get back, Mom. They heave them out without stopping. There's the bundle. And there's my picture right on the front page. Wait a minute. I'll, I'll cut the string. Yes, sir. There's your picture, all right. And here's the story beside it. Hey, wait a minute. Look, I'm in the picture, too. Yes, you might have ruined everything, Riley. As it is, you mar the effect of my appearance, standing there in front of me in your shabby work clothes. Well, read what the story says, Riley. But, uh, it says, uh, it says, picture at left shows this Easter's best-dressed man. The winner of the Tribune's $200 prize is the man in overalls. <laughs> if this war worker will call at the Tribune office, he will receive his check. Peg, Peg, you read it. I'm up getting dizzy. Hot ziggity! Let's see. In a country at war, every minute on the job counts. And because this citizen's work-stained garb shows that he had been at his job yesterday, instead of strutting like a peacock and wearing out valuable shoe leather, the judges have decided that he is their unanimous choice for this year's best-dressed man. Oh, Riley, isn't it wonderful? Oh, yeah, it's it's great. I can see it all now. A whole new career. My picture in all the magazines. (laughs) Riley in morning overall. Riley in afternoon overall. (laughs) Riley in evening overall. (laughs) Riley in beach overall. The life of Riley proved popular enough that in June it was moved to Sundays at 10 p.m. Beginning in the fall of 1945, it moved to NBC where it was a mainstay for six seasons. It peaked in the 1947-48 year with a rating of 20.1, good for 14th overall. A TV version debuted in October of 1949, first with Jackie Gleason as Riley, and later with William Bendix playing the familiar role for five years begins again throughout the land. The 30 million men, women, and children regularly living and working on farms, no matter how great their devotion to their country and their calling, can't do the job alone. Four million extra workers, a half a million more than last year, will be needed to lend them extra hands at some time or other in this 1944 growing season. So when the call comes from your county extension agent, 
for high school boys and girls to enroll as Victory Farm volunteers, for women who will train and enroll as members of the Woman's Land Army, or when a friend or relative on a farm asks your help for a week or for the summer, be sure that your community and you are ready to do your share in helping to meet the nation's wartime food goals. Feed for farm animals, food for your table, food for our fighters, depend on this year's crops. All statements regarding the nutritional value of meats made on this program are accepted by the Council on Foods and Nutrition of the American Medical Association. Two hundred bucks for not changing my clothes. <laughs> well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Correction, Riley. It seems you're a monkey's nephew. <clears throat> well, the old order changes. Oh, well. Riley, let me be the first to congratulate you. Your greasy hand, sir. <laughs> uncle Baxter, that spoke like a man. Shake. And any time you want to dress up in real style after this, just look me up. You, you invite me to borrow your clothes? Uh, sure. I always got an extra pair of them overalls handy. And Uncle Baxter, everybody looks swell in overalls. The Life of Riley, starring William Bendix and sponsored by the American Meat Institute, will be back next week at this same time. William Bendix appears on this program by arrangement with Hal Roach. The Life of Riley was directed by Don Bernard with music by Lou Kozloff and came to you from Hollywood. This is Ken Nile saying, see you next week. <laughs> this is the Blue Network. This is WENR at your service, Chicago 54.